supports that uh, group and brings them together. So we're going to talk to you a little bit first of all about the inhaler work and go through that. And then if we have time at the end, we'll have a little touch on polypharmacy as well and the effect of that on the environment. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, you can use Slido on your computer that you're on and you can also use it on a device such as a mobile phone or tablet if you happen to have that to hand. So hopefully that has appeared for folks okay and you can either scan the QR code to go into the quiz or you can um, put the number in to the website and we're just going to go through a quick quiz. You can either, if you are feeling dead confident, you might want to put your own name in as part of the quiz. If you are feeling a little bit less confident, um, then you might want to be anonymous for the quiz. Um, and we'll just have a little look at a few facts and figures about inhalers that we'll go through. I have to say it was absolutely fascinating for me when I was reading the information to put this presentation together. You know, when you just get sidetracked and you just want to spend all your time reading something. Um, so I was a very sad one last night and sat and read, um, well, I'll share the link with you later on, just about the history of inhalers, because to me it was absolutely fascinating. You might not quite find it quite as fascinating, but you never know. Come on, folks, we've got three in. Get your names in there. Hey, excellent. We'll make a start on the quiz. OK, so question one, which type of inhaler was invented first? Is it a metered dose inhaler, a dry powder inhaler or a soft mist inhaler? Get your responses in, folks. If you're not sure, just have a guess. Go for it. Uh, choose one. Quick, quick. Oof. There we go. OK. So, oh, people think it's a soft mist inhaler. It was actually a dry powder inhaler. The first meter dose inhaler, what was it based upon? Is it steam, printer ink, hairspray, or osmosis? What was the inspiration for the first meter dose inhaler? If you're not sure, just woof. Okay, there we go. Oh, it was hairspray. I'll tell you all in a minute. It's a fascinating story. Which of these is a propellant that's used in modern MDI inhalers? I snuck a funny one in here. Was it hydrofluoroalkanes, carbohydrate, dihydrogen monoxide, or acetic acid? Which is the propellant used in modern MDI inhalers? Okay. Last one, there we go. Oh, it's hydrofluoroalkanes, HFAs. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, dihydrogen monoxide is the chemical formula for water. So that was my sneaky one. Okay, next question. So what proportion of the outer case of an inhaler is made from recycled materials? Is it half, a quarter, 10% or 0%? The proportion of the outer case, the plastic case of an inhaler made from recycled materials. Okay, I think that's everybody in. Okay, it's 0%. They have to use virgin materials because it's a medical device. And last question for you. I hope this is a nice, easy one. <laughs> if not, Vicky will tell you later. Um, what is the best place to dispose of a part used or an empty inhaler? Is it in your home bin, 
recycling centre, community pharmacy or a litter bin. Everyone's very quick on that. I'm sure you've all got it. Oh, yes. Look at that. Community pharmacy. Amazing. Right. Should we have a look and have a look on the leaderboard? JC. Who's JC? J hey! Points to you, JC. Well done. Yeah, I think it's just more luck than judgment. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. OK, so um, let's just very quickly then go through a little bit of information that we've we've just talked about on the quiz there. Um, so a bit of a short history of inhalers. Uh, it is a device containing medicines to deliver into the lungs for respiratory conditions where it has a direct action on the airways. Um, it's been used throughout history as far back as they think ancient China and the ancient Egyptians, uh, where there was a pot that contained smoking active ingredients. Originally, this might be atropine based or opium for a cough uh, or mucus, for example. And again, they were used and illustrated throughout the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. And then in the 18th century, they realised actually if you put a little bit of hot water in there and got some steam out, that it was even better. And in 1778, the Mudge inhaler was invented, which was the first steam type inhaler. You can see that on the left hand side there that was used for um, opium fumes in water for a mucousy cough. And then that continued on. So through the 19th century, um, the atomizer was invented. You can see that in the top middle. And then in the middle at the bottom, you can see the first DPI, which was invented in the 1850s. This was way ahead of its time. This was a glass inhaler with a reusable twistable vial. So the vial could be replaced each time. You didn't have to um, dispose of the whole, in, whole inhaler. And then we moved on through the into the 20th century and the aerohaler there recognizable as as an inhaler on the top right hand side as a device. And then in the 1950s, Susie Mason complained to her father, who happened to work at a pharmaceutical company lab, um, that she didn't like her, her uh, squeezy bulb nebulizer because it made her cough and asked why it couldn't just spray into the back of her throat like a can of hairspray did. And the Medihaler that you can see on the right hand side there was developed in 1956. So there were lots of different ingredients from those relieving uh, for emergencies, such as salbutamol, and um, those that reduce inflammation, such as steroids, such as fluticasone, which are used in the more modern type of inhalers that we're all familiar with. And a lot of those have propellant to propel into your lungs and make it work and get to where it needs to be. Um, they came around sort of as we said in the 50s and were produced um, through to the 1980s when we got propellants including chlorofluorocarbons. So these were really, really good at forming really small aerosols. But unfortunately, in the 70s, we discovered that these release um, radicals when they're exposed to sunlight, which in turn, when it's up in the atmosphere, breaks down ozone. And those of you who are older like me will remember the breakdown of the ozone layer um, and think, well, nobody talks about that anymore. No, we don't talk about it anymore because in the late 80s and then through into the 90s, we were phasing out the use of CFCs across everything. And that included inhalers. So again, I've been in the business a long time. I remember in dispensing inhalers that contain CFCs but they were slowly replaced with the HFAs that we talked about into the 90s and the, the noughties and, and phased out by the mid noughties. So um, again, there was a large amount of uh, innovation across pharmaceutical companies around this time. Lots of different inhalers, MDIs and DPIs um, came through. But really then when we've discovered that HFAs ain't so good for the environment either, um, DPIs are back. So they were the first to be in vogue and it seems like they're now back in vogue again. So what's the issue with metered dose inhalers? Well, these contain the HFA propellants, as we mentioned, and these um, we've discovered do have a large carbon footprint. They contribute just over 3% of the carbon footprint of the NHS, the total carbon footprint of the NHS. And you can see on the right hand side of the document there, it's around 3% for the North East and North Cumbria. Um, but there are effective alternatives that are available. So those that use less propellant, those that use different types of propellant and the um, dry powder inhalers, which don't have propellant in or have a, a completely different type or aqueous mist type of inhalers. 
So this work, we, we kind of knew about it, but we thought, what do we do about it? And last year there was work in, in primary care around two different themes. So some of it was around the respiratory theme. So reviewing people who were underusing their um, preventer inhalers or overusing their emergency inhalers. And really these were chosen as what we call the NRAD criteria, the National Review of Asthma Deaths, because asthma does still kill. And these are the people that it was most likely to kill or most likely to have a hospital admission. Um, obviously that is not good for the individual. It's also not good for the environment because they have to be transported into uh, hospital and there's the the waste and carbon footprint of their stay in hospital and obviously I'm sure they would much rather um, prefer to be at home indulging in the activities that they love doing so this is to help them get there there was also the environmental sustainability side so the choice of what inhalers that we used so the DPI preventer inhalers and the emergency inhalers with a low carbon footprint and our secondary care specialists in NCIC um, led by Matthew Lane um, were really driving that change through the guidelines and education that they were um, providing into the system. So just give you a quick look at the data of, of where we are now. This is over the last couple of years, but it really shows change in the last 12 months. So your left hand graph there is having a look at the carbon footprint for salbutamol inhalers prescribed. And the right hand one is having a look at the amount, um, the volume of MDI inhalers. So you can see there's been a lot more change perhaps in the salbutamol footprint than the MDI to DPI. But on the other hand, we're already really good at that. We're amongst the best in the country um, for our use of DPI. So that's something really positive that we as North Cumbria can celebrate. Just to have a look at the other two, uh, the NRAD criteria. So this is for people using a high volume of SABA inhalers. And despite the great work that we've done, and you can see England, the dotted line on the bottom coming down, North Cumbria, which is the solid line, um, has remained stubbornly high. Um, so we'll look forward to hearing from uh, Jenny shortly about how we can think and work differently to support people with this. And then this is people's preventer inhalers. Um, so people who are not using enough preventer inhalers. So we're at the lower end of this. So we do have a lot of people who are using their preventer inhaler and we're one of the better parts of the country for this. So that's really positive. But actually looking at the numbers, it's still hovering at about half of people and maybe not using enough. Um, so again, is this something that we can think differently about? And the RDTC recommended five key actions. I've put a link on at the end so you can click onto the slide um, when you receive them and have a look at the documents to have a look at this in a little bit more depth. So that's optimising the respiratory care first and foremost. It's making sure that um, people have the right inhalers, that they have an inhaler they can use and that they know how to use it. It's about supporting them in between those appointments to make sure they've got appropriate information that's, that's tailored to their needs. Um, so that they know what they're doing in between the time that they see you. Then you've got the lower carbon options. So all the time there are new inhalers that have come out and it can be quite confusing. Um, it is a formulary consideration now when things are added as to um, which ones are added and trying not to add the higher ones and promoting the use of the DPI inhalers, the dry powder inhalers that don't contain that propellant and lower carbon options for the metered dose inhalers that, that do have the propellant. Um, reusable devices, some people may choose to use those as well. So to be able to minimise that waste, people knowing when their inhaler is empty, knowing how to return it and Vicky's going to come on and talk about how we're going to um, support that shortly. And then the things that aren't related to medicines, so air pollution, for example, in our towns or if somebody lives near a motorway and um, people who smoke, um, sometimes obesity, again, can have an impact on someone's ability to be able to breathe. So uh, things like that can make a real difference uh, to their lung conditions. And then lastly, the recommended vaccinations. So where somebody has uh, gets flu or COVID, then it can have a really bad impact again on their lung condition uh, if they're already affected. So making sure that they've got that protection in place um, is all the more important for them to be able to protect them. And if you want a guide, bit of a guide to help you through, we've got health pathways and the hospital health pathways are now available um, to talk you through some of this. 
So you're thinking there's an awful lot out there. How do I bring it all together? And there's the At A Glance Inhaler Guide, which talks you through the Greener Practice Toolkit that's now available. This wants to improve better patient outcomes through that better respiratory disease control talks you through some of the data that's available, talks you through some of the resources that are available if you're thinking where do I start with my project um, and again Jenny will be talking you through lots of this shortly. So then it's like actually what do I do with it? So inhaler technique we've talked about that and you think oh that's easy isn't it? We'll just watch a video but actually um, can you demonstrate to somebody how to do it? Is everyone confident to talk to patients? So there might be different people so your nurse might be talking to them them. your pharmacy technician might be talking to them are they confident do they know where the um, resources are so it's those thoughts around signposting and making sure that everybody's got what they need um, for example through health pathways to be able for them to do that and then who do you need to talk to so um, again your reception team might come into contact with somebody your community pharmacy might come into contact with somebody who um, your nurse might not ordinarily see for example somebody who might not have been coming in for their respiratory review might ring up for something else might pop to reception might pop to the pharmacy um, and supporting them making sure they've got your the right messages and the right information as well to be able to share back to the person and again we'll we'll look forward to hearing from Vicky about how some of that's going to be happening over the coming months and your data of course as well that we just looked at before so making sure that you know where you're at and um, where you want to get to. So get action planning, who do you need to speak to, what's their focus, what kinds of resources do they need to put it in and um, can you demonstrate them so you know can you save those links into bookmarks and um, can you save your health pathways into a bookmark so that you can access it where you need it um, and how do we really support our frontline teams to be able to um, benefit from this so that our patients can benefit as well. So um, we've been really lucky as a North East North Cumbria Integrated Care Board that we've received some funding from NHS England for a disposal and recycling pilot. There isn't a lot of evidence about this at the moment, which is why I haven't talked about it in a huge amount of depth today. There's a lot of educated guesses and there's potentially a bit of greenwashing out there, but we want to get a much more uh, formal evidence base around it. So we're really lucky that we've been chosen um, to take that forward. So we'll look forward to being able to share uh, what is happening with that as it progresses over the coming months and there's a list of resources there that I've referred to. So um, that's it from me. Um, Ashley, hand back to you. I'm having problems getting off mute there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helena. Really appreciate it. Has anybody got any questions for Helena before we uh, hand over to, to Vicky? I thought it was fascinating. I didn't know any of that history about inhalers. That was amazing. Who knew it came from hairspray? Interesting. Any questions for Helena? No. Oh, I've got me me Melanie in the chats, but that was really interesting. Thank you. That's good. Cool. I will hand over to Vicky. It is Vicky next, isn't it? I've got that right, haven't I? I, I think we'll go in whatever order you want to call <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> good stuff. Um, good stuff. Uh, over am to I you, to Vicky. Share my screen? Yeah, that would be perfect. Thank you. Does that come up on the screen okay? Yeah, we've got it, Vicky. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so obviously everybody's got to have an opening slide, so I'll, I'll go through my opening slide and then I'll, you know, I'll go through. But basically the, um, I'm going to click through because it will be a lot easier. I'll, this one obviously um, Helena's already spoken about, but this is where it started in um, Sunderland. So in Sunderland, we identified that there was a need to have a look at um, the amount of salbutamol inhalers that were being prescribed. So we um, commissioned a company called Magpie, who are based in Leeds, to have a look at their behaviour change model um, to see why why we were higher and what could be done to to change that. But by doing it in a behaviour change way. So when I say behaviour change, what I mean is 
previously we were we you know years and years ago we didn't have a recycle bin we only had our waste bins that we would put our household waste into whereas now we've got a recycle bin and i dare say that everybody on this call today knows what they can put in their recycle bin and over time from the beginning of them being introduced to now people have changed their behavior and will put more or the correct stuff into the bin this method the, the the behavior change method is something that magpie the company use and i'm going to go on to the next slide because it's uh, it, it's a bit complicated isn't it it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit ott right but the the, the 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 thinking behind it is that there's a model where you look at capability so can people do what you're asking them to do is there an opportunity and what motivates people to do it so we give magpie all the information you know this is what we're trying to do. How can you help us? They spoke to loads of professionals, loads of um, patient, patient groups. There was a Breathe Easy group that was based in South, um, South Shields and collated all this information and put it into this Combi model. Combi model. Um, and the two, the two high takeaway messages, because there's more than just the two on the screen here, are, were that taking their old inhaler with them when they were collecting their new one from the pharmacy um, but also changing to a more environmentally friendly when offered it in review. To make sure that we didn't confuse the messages and that we were doing this in the correct way for the combi model to work and for it to be change people's behaviour, we went with two approaches. So the first one that ran a few months back now they that um the take your all inhaler with you when you collect a new one we did that we got embedded into the community and the response from patients was outstanding they they did not know or weren't aware of that the community pharmacy would take them back and it was astonishing to read some of the comments that we got back on Facebook. Somebody had put on for what was it for 40 years? I didn't think inhalers have been along around that long, but obviously we've heard earlier on that they have been. So for 40 years, that person had been putting them in the household waste. Um, and there were, there were, there were, I think the, the response was that they were so shocked that they could take them back. Um, and some of the, you know, people using emojis to express how how happy they were that they could take them back some people were commenting saying is this every pharmacy across the region across Sunderland and we're like yeah yeah they've all been briefed we've told everybody you know this is where you need to this is what you need to do um and it was really interesting to see how something so simple about that you know take them back to your community pharmacy had such a powerful message and response from the public so we started all of that that one's as i say that one's underway we started the change in people's behavior with that but suddenly within those messages we did want to encourage people to go and have a review um which then led us into the phase two of the campaign um it was sort of like keep it together so that people knew we were part of the same thing um so phase two was launched i would say about a month and a half ago and it hasn't been as positive as taking your inhaler back. However, people are saying that obviously it's the usual NHS trying to save money, you know, uh, what a load of blah, blah, blah. Anyway, no matter whether it's negative or positive, the fact that people are commenting on the post that they've seen is, is a, to me, is a positive. People are actually reading the message, engaging with it, but then that point plants a seed, it plants a seed here for them to then think, actually, you know is it actually working and it starts that that spiral um and it starts that that way of thinking um i've got two personal stories that i have to tell because i'm so I, i'm not an inhaler user my partner is and one of my long-term friends is so i'm not from I'm, I'm from sunderland but i live in stockton and while i've been doing this campaign um my partner has been putting these inhalers in the bin so i went off it grabbed his inhalers and said, right, I'm going out to our community pharmacy. And he's like, Vicky, they'll not take them. They'll not take them. I said, watch, because I was equipped with all the information I needed. And I knew in their contract 
community pharmacies, I've got to take them back. So officer trots to the local pharmacy, like, foot, ready for a fight, like 100% ready just to argue my case. Handed them over and the guy just took them off his and said, yep, I'll put them out the back. Next time I went in, there was little slips on the counter that the pharmacy had put together themselves that basically said, bring your own your old inhaler back for safe disposal. Now, this campaign isn't running in Stockton yet, but that one incident where I went and then I don't know whether it's come from the LPC or what, but that's one change of behaviour. So what I did by taking these inhaler back, I feel like I helped to change the behaviour of that, that community pharmacy. I probably didn't, but that's how I feel. Also, a friend from, that I've had for, from the, being born, um, she was on inhalers and has been on inhalers, has asked now, has been admitted to hospital numerous times. And she was on Sabutmol. Two, three years ago, she was changed over to Foster. Now, before she was changed to Foster, she was admitted to hospital, I would have said about three times a year. Now she's been on the Foster for that length of time, for, you know, a good couple of years. She has, um, she's only been admitted to hospital once. So, one, she, 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 she clearly wasn't either using it correctly or it wasn't right for her. And two, the amount of time and upset for her family, not just the savings to the NHS, because that ma doesn't matter, it's about the patient. That, the fact that she can she can now have a, have a life and be there to support our kids without having to be struggling when she's having to be admitted to hospital, is, is it, it's invaluable. It's not, you know, people are saying that we're doing these campaigns for, you know, saving the, the saving of the money. It's not. And I think this campaign as we build it and as it builds momentum we need to look at the patient's stories and get them put in because it could it better heard from somebody who's gone through it so anyway i'll stop rambling on about that but i'm dead passionate about it um so the next slide that, I, that, that is about what we're doing so what's going to happen what's what's the step so i've been working with colleagues across the region trying to gather insight get contact names, dealing with respiratory teams, to compile all the information that we need to make sure that we're targeting the right places at the right time, um, know of all the little networks that we need to be involved in. So that bit has been done. Um, I've also been engaging with um, the company Magpie and again, loads of other organisations to make sure they're briefed in, ready for us to roll out. And we plan to roll out in June. We did want to roll out in April, but then we have the elections, so PERDA stops us from doing it until after today. Um, but there's still a little bit more work that we just need to fine tune before we start sending all the resources out. I'm going to stop sharing there. I did have another slide, but I don't feel like I want to want to I want to go into that one. But I can't for for not being a clinician, um, and and being the business support side of things. I can't say enough how much this has impacted on my life and my family's life and my friends. But it it it, it just it just is the right thing to do, and I can't stress that enough. Um, and I am very passionate about it, and I would happily speak to anybody who wants to talk about it in depth. Um, I could talk about it for hours. A bit like our our lovely Helena there. So I will stop and let others have their presentation. Brilliant, thank you so much, Vicky. It's, it's lovely to see your passion. It really is, it's fantastic. So it's really good. My husband use inha uses inhalers, so I'm gonna have to question him later on as to whether he is actually recycling them at the pharmacy. I've got a funny feeling he probably isn't. So at, at I think minute, I'm gonna be dragging him there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't say recycling just for safe disposal. Yeah, because we haven't got disposal, that. Yeah, we yes, haven't got that okay. bit nailed just yet, but um, hopefully we will. <laughs> Thank you. Good stuff. No, that's great. Any questions for Vicky? No. Okay. Uh, oh. do, is it across oh. Cumbria and the northeast that you campaign in June? It is, Jenny. Yes, her. Okay. Brilliant. Lovely. We'll definitely be involved. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I will now hand over uh, to Dr. Jenny Calvert. Over to you. Okay.
Has that worked? Can you see the slides? Yeah, we've got it. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. So, yeah, I'm Jenny. I'm one of the GPs at Maryport. I was asked to just speak briefly about the work that the respiratory team have been doing here to reduce our SABA prescribing and therefore our carbon footprint, which is what it's all about. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that this has been a team effort and um, mainly by the rest of the team and not by me, but they're all too shy to come and talk. Um, we've got a big MDT team here for our respiratory services. We've got two nurses, we've got HCA, we've got a student nurse involved. We've got a clinical pharmacist involved. The medicines management team are heavily involved as well. So they've all worked really hard on this. Um, and I'll just take you through kind of the approach that we had and what we did. It, we kind of went for a three-pronged approach and um, obviously patient care and better care is always kind of our prime goal. Um, so we wanted to look at optimising treatment to get patients better control, improving the concordance by involving them in the decision making and making a plan together that suited them. It's obviously different for different people um, and bearing in mind the environmental impact of our prescribing and the inhalers that we're using because that is becoming more and more of an issue. So we started off by looking at where we were and traditionally, you know, across the country we followed BTS and ICE guidelines but certainly here we had a lot of unregulated ordering of SABA inhalers um, which led to overordering and overuse which was very costly for the practice and for the NHS but we also knew that you know by the sheer fact they were overordering them overusing them there was definitely poor technique involved and definitely poor control um, which led to more symptoms more exacerbations more hospital admissions, which in itself is costly, but not just to the NHS, but as you mentioned earlier, Vicky, to the patient and their families. Um, and we were also aware by this kind of massive over-ordering, over-using of the SABAs that we were producing quite a lot of excess pharm pharmaceutical waste, which you know doesn't normally find its way back to the pharmacies, which is what we've just been talking about. And, you know, in the background of this, we had increasing evidence coming out about salbutamol hypersensitivity and how that might affect control and symptoms and the ever increasing kind of push to reduce our carbon footprint and the environmental effect of our prescribing which is certainly something new over the last few years really. So what, what did we do? Um, our aims were to try and ensure that all asthmatics were on an inhaled corticosteroid to improve their control um, and also to therefore reduce their need of relievers and SABA inhalers. So we made a decision that anyone who's already well controlled we would leave be and they're obviously doing what they were doing right and we were happy with them um, unless they came to us. But anybody who was coming with poor control or frequent exacerbations or was found seemed to be over ordering their relievers and their SABAs, they were the group that we kind of looked at. Um, and we definitely tried to go for the individualised uh, approach, tailoring the device for the patient um, and you know what they could use, what they were happy with using, but also spending more time with inhaler technique and education and being mindful always to try and go for the greener option if we can, that suits the patient. So we weren't necessarily saying one size fits all, but always trying to go towards those greener options. Um, we made a decision as a respiratory team um, to follow more of the GINA guidelines um, and they very much advocate inhaled corticosteroids for all asthmatics and using the MARP system as well um, and we've certainly found that the MARP system is much more user friendly and understandable for patients and they gain control of their own disease and asthma and they feel more in control. But we very much kind of involved the patient, individualised their treatment plan, got them involved in making their plans and shared decision making about what they were going to do. Our aim, like I said, was always to get people on inhaled corticosteroids and reduce their reliance on the, um, the relievers and the SABA inhalers. But it was a real, a, 
you know, MDT approach. It wasn't just the nurses in clinic doing this. You know, the pharmacist has been involved in talking to patients. Medicines management team were involved in highlighting people who were over ordering. Um, and, you know, ultimately we were trying to help patients gain control of their own asthma and get better control. Um, but alongside trying to improve their control, um, we had the environmental uh, impact in, in the back of our minds as well. Um, and we, we've heard how DPIs are better for the environment, or less damaging, and there are other new inhalers coming out. Um, so we were always trying to move people towards these better options if we can. Um, we set up a, a collection point to drop off inhalers. I know the nurse is encouraging to bring the old ones back to their appointments. Um, we certainly will be involved in any campaigns about using local pharmacies as well. Um, and we, we made a switch. All our Sabas um, that were on repeat, were the MDIs were all switched over to Solomon and we reduced the numbers of repeats available to patients so that when they reached that limit, if they were using them regularly or trying to overorder, that would trigger us to then bring them in for review. We did encounter many problems along the way, as you can always imagine. I mean, historically, I think nationally, well, probably worldwide, it has been an over-reliance on using that blue inhaler. You know, you see the football players using it on the side of the pitch. You know, and whether this is habit or it's down to poor education, um, there's probably lots of elements there. We also had some reluctance um, from other clinicians about maybe changing guidelines and what the plan that we were doing. But, you know, we had a couple of sessions, teaching sessions and meetings to go through this. We had a lot of reluctance from the patients, as you can imagine. Um, you know, some patients have managed their asthma in a certain way all their lives. Um, but we found that, you know, you know, especially giving them the time and explaining it, certainly, you know, the younger uh, cohort were very much more happy to change. Um, but this did lead to increased clinic times and, you know, demand on the, not just the nurses, but pharmacists and the medicines management. It's proved quite a timely exercise, but I think one that's definitely been worth it. And now we're encountering problems with availability. So um, that's now affecting, we've changed all these people and managed to make a difference, but we're struggling to get hold of the, the less damaging inhalers that we want to use for them. So um, we have managed to reduce the amount of inhalers that we've got on repeat, especially the Sabo inhalers. Um, we've reduced the amount of devices per patient. We've managed to change, so increase the doses, so we're using less inhalers per patient as well. And a good thing that's come out is that the team is developed as a, a good, cohesive, collaborative team. So that's great. And in the figures that you know you guys sent through to us, these are your figures, <laughs> but they clearly show we have managed to, because this red line is, um, reduce the number of subutamol inhalers and therefore our carbon footprint. Um, and we've also managed to reduce the ratio of preventer to relievers and reduce the number of MDIs out with subutamol that we've been prescribing. So, you know, all in all, it's been quite successful. Uh, that's, that's the one about the MDIs, yeah. And there we go. I said I wasn't going to talk for long. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, Jenny absolutely fantastic to see those figures as well it just shows that that the hard work paid off didn't it yeah and amazing the team took a lot of a, a lot of like as you said you know why we're we doing this we're trying to say mm. i think you know I, I have to say i've I've not been the most heavily involved in this the team has done it uh, but they're too shy to come and blow their own trumpet <laughs> but, um, you know they, they've spent a lot of time talking it through with patients and you know, I certainly think the patients that we have moved, we haven't wholesale moved everybody onto SMART, but the ones that we have um, find that it gives them the control to manage their own disease. And, you know, they th I think they find it simpler. They've just got the one inhaler. Um, it, I, I think that that has been a big part of why, why it's been successful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Brilliant. 
Any questions for Jenny from anybody? They've been very quiet today. Very quiet out there. Okay, th thank you so much, Jenny. That was brilliant. Fab to hear, you know, definitely the work that's going on there. So, yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Okay, I'm going to now hand back to Helena. Helena, do you think there's enough time to go through the I second will, part? I will not go through it in depth, but I will just give a little touch upon it, if that's okay for Perfect. folks today Lovely. about overprescribing. Amazing. Thanks, Helena. Brilliant. Um, so, this is thinking about why overprescribing matters in terms of the environment. So the amount of stuff that we use, um, obviously, the more that we use, the bigger the impact it has on the environment, the bigger the carbon footprint, the more waste we're chucking out, the more water we're using to produce it and so on. Um, and some of it is completely appropriate. So sometimes we do have to use more stuff. And by stuff in this context, I'm thinking of medicines. Um, so if we're helping someone to manage a long term condition, then it's really important that we support their quality of life, their length of life, um, and to be able to do the things that they want to do. Um, but sometimes it's really not helpful to that person and the amount of stuff we're using is bad for that person and the planet. So in some cases where the risk is too great and it actually causes them harm, it might give them a hospital admission, um, it might kill them. Um, when it's no longer needed, but there's still the risk of something going wrong there, um, or when there are better alternatives, when actually we're giving them something that doesn't help them um, in the same way for that, that quality and length of life. And obviously that's not one of any of us go to work to do. So we come to work to help people have that quality of life, have that length of life. Um, but the system and the culture around us doesn't always help. So I think Jenny described some of that quite well in a, her presentation about the things that help and hinder you along the way. Um, and we're faced with those challenges every day, particularly as care becomes more complex and sits between lots of different people. It doesn't necessarily always sit with you. So it can be a little bit tricky to, to you know, be able to do what we want to do. Um, so I just wanted to share with you today a little bit about the impact. So um, Jenny, I'm just going to take over the sharing if that's okay. So this is looking at an individual uh, person. This is Jeff and um, we're going to have a look at an antipsychotic product that's being prescribed for Jeff. So Jeff has uh, dementia, unfortunately, um, and lives at home with his family, his wife that you can see there who, who cares for him. So for uh, an antipsychotic that might be prescribed, the research and development might be done in the UK, the raw materials and manufacture might be done in China, we ship it back to the UK, um, and then, oh, there we go, ship it back to the UK. Then once it's in the UK, we had then it might arrive in a port in the south and we then have to ship it up to Newcastle where the wholesalers are. Then we might have to ship it out to uh, Silleth or Maryport in the west of Cumbria. And it's going there on trucks, it's going on vans. You've got all of the emissions. You've got things that happen at sea such as whale strikes or affecting our um, sea life colonies that are out there. So there's actually not just the box, but there's actually the logistics in that that's affected by it as well. And that's just the box of that medicine itself that may or may not be needed and then of course when that box gets into the pharmacy you've got the staff you've got the lighting you've got the electrical products you've got the packaging that it's put in and um, the patient travel to go and get it you've got shelves that need you know it's again all of these things are, are part of the the stuff that we use and then when somebody gets it Again, it may not be disposed of in the way that we would think of. So medicines that are left over can't be reused, so they may go into domestic waste. And then, as we said, it, the most important thing about medicines is the individual. So for Jeff, for example, if he has a bad day, um, antipsychotic medication might be started to help calm him down. If it doesn't get reviewed and continues and we say, actually, Jeff, what's the matter with you? You've had an outburst and we've given you this because we've not had the time to support us with it. Um, then actually that medication might continue. But actually, for this medicine, for somebody with dementia, it can more than double the risk of stroke. Um, so it takes it from under 1% 
to just over 2% for people? And actually, are they getting the most out of life if they're being sedated? Should they be unlucky enough to be one of those 2% of people and have a stroke, then the life-changing effects of disability, deconditioning, the financial impact on that individual, the travel to and from, actually can be really, really huge. Um, and for each hospital stay for somebody with a stroke, it's around 500 kilograms of carbon dioxide, just short of 800 cubic metres of water and just over 50 kilograms of waste. And then when they come out of hospital, if they're lucky enough, then you've got the reablement, you've got the carers who are travelling around every day, in addition to their, their personal effects. So obviously we don't want that to happen to somebody um, and we want to make sure that they're having the options again, as Jenny described, about the risks, the benefits and the different options for them. If we take a maybe a different approach to that and say, actually, Jeff, what matters to you? We might find out that Jeff loves gardening and he's feeling really frustrated having outbursts because he's not able to garden and actually spending time out and about with his allotment helps bring joy and calm. And we've got a lot of people now coming into our primary care work care networks, our health and wellbeing coaches, social prescribing link workers, green social prescribers, um, who are supporting a lot of the activity work that they can do. So by stopping that medication, increasing that activity, that time spent in nature reduces the risk of stroke. Um, it's obviously less than half of when he was taking the antipsychotic and someone's mental health can be better. But as Jenny said, it can take a bit more time and be a bit more complex um, init initially to get to that point. So it's not necessarily that straightforward. Um, so we've had a look at it there. So for every year you'd have 13 boxes per person travelling across. Um, we've reduced the number of people with dementia who are taking antipsychotics. Um, we've got about 500 boxes fewer travelling the world every year because of the work that we've done in addition to that person's quality and length of life. Um, and it's absolutely fantastic to hear the quality of life that's Im improving for people speaking to their carers and finding out actually what it can do in addition to that um, decreased risk for the individual and that decreased risk to the planet. And this applies to lots of different things where that risk and benefit isn't always so great. So things like opioids, gabapentinoids, antibiotics, um, lipids and hypertension medicines, insomnia. Um, what's best for that individual is quite often also what's best for the planet and working on the shared decision making approach and asking what matters to you can really make a difference here. If we did this really, really well, um, we could save a huge amount, so over 6,000 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions, 9 million cubic metres of fresh water and 720 tonnes of waste every year based on a, a nice suggestion. Um, and actually, you know, in the North East and North Cumbria, we do have higher rates of prescribing, so it is potentially even larger than this. But just to give you a picture of what that amount of carbon dioxide looks like that we could save across the North East and North Cumbria, um, that's three million medium sized carbon dioxide fire extinguishers. If you can imagine those all piled up in a very large car park, um, that is potentially what we could save. So actually, taking some of the time and utilising those new staff um, to do things and actually saying sometimes the medicine will help, if it will help, if it will prevent, this is fantastic, let's um, support you to take it and actually if it's not helping, if it's giving you harm or if there's something better, um, let's support the alternatives. Now I recognise that there are a lot of um, obstacles to kind of overcome with that, so it's things around making sure that referrals are available and that um, people know who to talk to, that you've got the, the staff there and not everybody's got the same thing. So it is a little bit tricky um, but I think we're on a, a really good path to something and as you can see the sheer volume of difference that we can make for those individuals we've talked through an individual story um, but actually the benefit that we could potentially make for the environment as well through looking at over prescribing is huge so I'm happy to take any comments or thoughts from people about what you guys need actually um, to put some of this into place so we've talked about things like health pathways before um, which we know are, are really helpful for clinicians but if there are any other resources um, or, or things that we could put in there that would be really helpful to support you on that reducing over prescribing what are the alternatives what are the risks and harms journey with patients then absolutely love to hear so that we can um, as I said before provide the right things for frontline clinicians so that you can support your patients in turn.
I was going to type it, but actually it's easier just to say it, isn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, uh, just a small thing, but it always comes back as an issue, is this uh, issue of pharmacies just ordering somebody's all somebody's repeat every month. And I, I'm sure that that is already part of your campaign to try and help with that one. But it would make a big, because often when we talk to them as clinicians, they say, well, we didn't order all that. It just comes every month. And I, I, you know, I don't know an easy way of tackling that, but whether it's part of your, your campaign to kind of involve the community pharmacists in it as well. I'm going to be real. She's going to absolutely hate me for this, but we've got the expert in the is in the room, and it's my fault that she came. Um, and Susie's done some brilliant work in Carlisle with this. So um, <laughs> I hope Susie's got a microphone um, because there is a lot of work that's going on around the Carlisle area at the moment to look at their systems and processes and the conversations between community pharmacies and practices so that you've not got that and people are on the right system that they get what they need when they need it more effectively and don't get what they need so I know they're doing a lot around that communication and electronic repeat dispensing at the moment um sorry Susie I don't know if you want to add anything to what I've said but you are the expert um thanks Helena <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, definitely it's one of the topics that we're trying to push that communication between pharmacy um, and practice and um, yeah, we, could, we can just push that up the, the agenda um, because it, we find here at Carlisle Healthcare that we have that problem that the, the requests come in um, and the patients, you know, a lot of the time haven't even requested the medication. My team are issuing prescriptions and because it's an inhaler, we probably don't look at it as, as well as we should do you think right it's it's been requested by the pharmacy it's due it's needed and you know it gets request it gets issued time after time so i think a little bit more concentration in practice um are looking at overusing and definitely that communication with practice and pharmacy it needs to really highlight um overusing definitely so yeah that's the second time you've done that to me helena <laughs> You never come into anything again, are you, Susie? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Just on that, one of the things that we found by reducing the salbutamol inhalers on repeat, like down to three, it would easily trigger to the medicines management then people who were over over ordering them. Um, uh, and that I think that's been a good way to identify the people to kind of start with. I'm definitely going to take that one away with me. So thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Helena. That was fantastic.